So just really, really quick to, um, we're going to meet next Wednesday and then Wednesday after that. And then we're going to take a few weeks off for the summer. We're, you know, part of it is we like to give the children workers a break. And then on the, actually the last Wednesday in June, we're going we're gonna to start our summer kind of program up. And then through July, we'll be doing stuff. So it's, everything's going to be in the bulletin this week if you have any questions. Um, and we have, we have a lot of things happening this summer. Um, John and Shauna are going to come back and lead worship for us in June, the end of June. So that'll be fun and um, some other things. So anyways, look in the bulletin. You'll, you'll learn all about it all. But the next two Wednesdays, we're going to be meeting, okay? Um, so, and let's, let me pray. Lord, as we open up Deuteronomy, please just bless us, Lord. Please uh, make these words come alive. Um, we know your word, all of it, Lord, is living and powerful and um, alive, Lord. So please speak to us, draw us near to you tonight, in Jesus' name, amen. Um, you know, I, I say that because, too, um, Deuteronomy 14 is an interesting chapter um, because it is, um, it's sometimes, I think, sometimes hard for us as Christians to relate to because it's talking about these foods that you can eat or not eat for the Jewish people, and it's talking about a tithe, and it's talking about um, um, other things, and and so I just pray that the Lord would speak to us in this, right? And I think, you know, he led me in a certain direction, and so let's, let's begin. Let me read the first few verses here of Deuteronomy chapter 14. It says, you are the children of the Lord your God. You shall not cut yourselves, nor shave the front of your heads for the dead. For you are a holy people to the Lord your God, and the Lord has chosen you to be a people for himself, a special treasure above all the peoples who are on the face of the earth. You know, I can't help but just think, isn't that, I, you know, I think it's kind of a word to us as believers, right? That we are a holy people. You know, we have a Lord. He's chosen us, right? We're special to him. And, um, you know, I was thinking about that, and, and I was just thinking about how sometimes in this world, especially that we live in right now, there's a lot of things, there's a lot of situations that seem hopeless. You guys, would you agree? I think a lot of times we see people out there, and they just are hopeless. They're just, you know, it's like they almost, they, you know, they almost have no hope. And, um, you know, I was... Lisa and I drove down, we had a pastor's meeting yesterday in, in North Seattle Shoreline area, and we got off the I-5, and there was this little homeless encampment, you know, you see those there, and it's so sad, isn't it, you know, to see it, and, and, um, and it's crazy, because it's almost like this lost cause, you know, and it's right there on this corner of this golf course. <laughs> you know, this really supposed to be this, you know, this nice place. And there, there's a lot of people kind of living right there. And, you know, it just, it seems like, you know, that there, it, it's, there's hope. It's, it's hopeless for them, right? I was also, as I was thinking about this, and as I was reading this verse again, I just, in verse one, it just was something that just kind of really touched my heart um, this week was where it says, you shall not cut yourselves. Do you notice that? And it just, I don't know, it just kind of was, I just kept on thinking about it, and I, I couldn't help but think about Mark chapter 5. So I want us to actually turn to Mark chapter 5, and, and, and then we'll go back to Deuteronomy here in a second. Because in Mark chapter 5, there was a fellow who was cutting himself and it, so it, it kind of spoke to me here. In Mark chapter 5, let me read just the first, few, first five verses here. It says, Then they came to the other side to the sea of the country of the Gadareans. And when he had come out of the boat, immediately there was met him out of the tombs a man with an unclean spirit who had his dwelling among the tombs. You know, just quickly, we're going to be reading about all these unclean foods that the Jews were not to eat. 
And here we see we have this unclean spirit that was in this man, or this you know, demonic spirit. In verse 3 it says, and, it, and who had his dwelling among the tombs, and no one could bind him, not even with chains, because he had often been bound with shackles and chains, and chains had been pulled apart by him. And the shackles broken in pieces, neither could anyone tame him. And always, night and day, he was in the mountains and the tombs crying out, cutting himself with stones. And, you know, as I read that verse in Deuteronomy and as, as I thought about this verse right here, I was thinking about this scene here in Mark and how there's really three different forces at work. We see, we see Satan, of course, is at work with these unclean spirits, these, the demonic forces. Uh, we see society, they, they were trying to tame him. They were trying to help. They are bind him up. They were trying to do something. They didn't know what to do. But then we'll see also that Jesus was involved. The Savior was involved, and we'll see that in a second. And, you know, these forces are at work today. We see the same, you know, the same thing almost is happening and different, but the, very similar. And we see this, I think, a vivid picture of what Satan can do to people. What, you know, what he can do to people, they, they hurt themselves. And, <clears throat> of course, we're told in the Bible that Satan is out to kill, to rob, and destroy. He wants to destroy people. He wants to destroy families. He wants to destroy relationships. He wants to destroy Christians, really, he, you know? And anything, anything of the Lord. You know, to be really honest, you know, when you're in ministry, he, he, you're, you have a target on your back. You know, you, he, wants, he wants to come after those people that are in ministry. And he, he often comes after pastor's kids, you know, because it's an easy target. Um, he, he wants to kill, rob, and destroy, as it says. And, 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 you know, because of Satan's power, this man that we read about here in Mark chapter 5, he had lost everything. I mean, he, he had lost his home, his family, his friends. Um, he lost his decency. He's, it says he's running around naked in the tombs, right? Uh, he lost his self-control. He's, uh, we, it's almost, you get the sense he's living like a wild animal. You know, they're trying to tame him, as it says. He's screaming. He's cutting himself again. You know, that's, that's the part that really, made, you know, was speaking to me is he was, he was hurting himself. It was frightening. It was, you know, he was, he was scary to, to citizens. You know, it, sometimes when you, you see some of the, these people and drugs or meth, meth, and it's like they're walking around like zombies in there, it's kind of scary. You know, you don't really know what to do with them. You can't think in, in, in the right mind. You're not, you can't have a normal conversation with them. And I just think that this, this man here, he lost his peace. He lost his purpose for living. And, and I think we see that in our world today. You know, in Deuteronomy, I think it's easy to read through these verses and, and, and just kind of skip over them and do nothing with that cutting part. But I, I think there's a reason why the Lord maybe put it there. And, and I was thinking just about, and I was reading some stuff about cutting in, in our culture. Um, it's actually an epidemic in our country. And it happens mostly with adolescent girls. They cut themselves. And, and normally it's because there, there's, you know, there's something deeper, more dangerous, even more sinister. It's a self-mutilation. It's a means of coping. Um, I was reading about it. It's, it's, you know, it's a coping strategy. They, 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 it helps relieve the tension. You know, they, 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 you know they, they feel like they're in control again, in a sense. And, and, um, and so... You know, and I just, I just think, like, this, this world is, is after our kids, you know, and, 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 and there's so many forces, and, you know, it's like, you know, you've seen about the school boards and, and the parents, now parents don't even have any, any control anymore, you know, what, they're, what is being, their kids are being taught, and, 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 and it's, I just see this destructiveness that's happening in in people's lives and kids lives especially it's this you know they're believing these lies of destructive lies and it's all from the enemy and in a sense it's similar to what we read about right here and that's the kind of destruction that satan wants to bring into people's lives that's the you know the devil he's seeking to 
to, to leave people naked, in a sense, and, and to, to leave them bound, to leave them tormented, and, and, and on the run. You notice this guy's on the run. <laughs> He's running around. And I, I think just, just simply to start out is we can never underestimate the power that Satan has. I mean, he has, he has destructive power, and we see it. Notice where this demon-possessed man was living. He's living in the tombs. He's living amongst the dead. And, and I think, you know, the, the, the cemetery, we might call it, and, and, and that's where demons are comfortable. They're, they're comfortable around dead things. But, but I want you to notice the next force we see is really the, the society, the people there. They, didn't, they did not know what to do with this man. They didn't know what to do. And so what do they try to do? They first try to bind him. That didn't work. They try to lock him up, but that didn't do the trick. You know, the same problem I think we see today. We see, you know, they say that um, people who are in prison, there's such a high percentage of them actually going back to prison. It's, it's astronomical, you know, how, how, you know the, ch- the chance of them getting back. And that's what happens is, you know, the enemy wants to isolate people. I even see this with Christians. You know, he wants to isolate us. Oh, no one cares. No one said hi to me at church or whatever it is. And, and so we go home, and they're like, I'm never going to church again or whatever. And, and people kind of isolate them or, or, or something happens, and they just, they, they just want, they go and they, you know, they, they don't fellowship. They're not, they're, you know, and that's the enemy. He wants us to believe those lies. You know, we try to institutionalize people or, you know, and, and I think what, what we see is people just kind of throw up their hands and they're like, we don't really know what to do. And it's kind of true. There is no real answers in some ways. That is, I hope they don't bug us. Type of thing. I hope they don't move into my neighborhood or something. You know, that, again, the homeless camps in Seattle, um, it's crazy. That, you know, that, that, that they've, and they've allowed it, right? Some of, some of it. I, I actually knew a guy, and his brother was a homeless, homeless man in Bellingham. And he told me that he did, he did not want to work. He, uh, he didn't want any responsibility. He, he actually chose to do it. He liked doing it. You know, you would think, who would like not to take showers or not, you know, to beg for food or whatever it was, but, but that was part of it. And I'm not saying there wasn't some kind of mental illness or, you know, along with that. But, um, you know, we see this. I know that a couple years ago I met with the, the Skagit County. They, they were trying to get churches to kind of partner with them and they wanted people to be able, they wanted to use their parking lot at night. And I, I was like, if they sent me a letter, I, I always try to respond to it. So I met, went down the county, I met with them. And, and it's, it's funny because they, they had no idea what they were trying to do. <laughs> they had absolutely no idea. And I just asked questions like, well, we don't really know. Well, a church in Seattle did this once. And I'm like, okay. <laughs> and uh, um, I asked, I always ask this question, hey, can I share the gospel? And I told them, this is what I mean by the gospel. When I shared the gospel with these two, these two gals. And they said, well, we don't really <laughs> encourage that, you know, type thing. And when, and when they say no to me on that, I, it's, a, it's a done deal for me. You know, you want to use our parking lot, but I can't share the most important thing in my life and what the, the answer to the, their, all their problems are, then it's a done deal. But, um, and I, and then my next question was, um, well, why don't you let them use the county buildings? There's no one here during the night, is there? And then they're like, ugh. <laughs> Anyways. <laughs> but it's like they just didn't have any, they didn't have any answers. There was no what's, you know. Anyways, I'll, I won't get on that. But. <sighs> Again, this society, it's just people throw up their arms and they don't know what to do. And, and I guess all that to say is Satan is working overtime. You know, he's working overtime, um, convincing young people to question their gender. Um, you know, all, all sorts of, we could just go on and on about all that stuff. And, but, but, but I want you to notice here, look, if you're still in Mark, look what happens when Jesus enters the scene. <laughs> look what happens. It, um, verse 6, is that where we're at? When he saw Jesus from afar... He ran and worshipped him. 
And he cried out with a loud voice and said, What have I to do with you, Jesus, Son of the Most High God? I implore you to you by God that you do not torment me. Now, here's something you may have never thought of, okay, before. But demons have faith in Jesus. Now, before you call me a heretic, okay, what I mean by it, it's not saving faith. But, but see, they, they, right here we see they came and worshiped Jesus. They knew exactly who he was. They, they understood and they recognized his, his power and his authority. When he was afar off, they recognized it. <laughs> and I just asked you this question, who's in control here? Jesus. <laughs> I mean, Jesus, guys, is the answer to all of the problems that we see out there, right? I mean, Jesus, he, he hasn't even said a word. He's, even, <laughs> he's not even close. He's afar off. And he just shows up on the scene, and the demons start freaking out at his mere presence. Here he comes. We're in trouble. <laughs> Please don't hurt us, Jesus. Please don't torment us. I think this should really solidify just the, the stance, you know, the power of Jesus. I mean, guys, Jesus has power. He has power. I, I think we, we, we forget that and over Satan and over the demonic forces. You know, sometimes I think we, people ask the question, can a Christian be demon-possessed? And I always say no, because Jesus, how can Jesus and a demon coexist in the same body? It's impossible. I mean, here we see demons, they don't want to be anywhere near Jesus. They don't want any, to be anywhere near. And they're in total submission to him. I mean, total submission. And so Jesus, the demons, they, they can't coexist. But, but, you know, if you don't have Jesus... And it's kind of open game. And we see people kind of opening themselves up in all sorts of ways, especially the drug. I mean, they're just opening themselves up to this demon, these demonic forces. Well, look how Jesus completely is in charge of the scene. Verse 8, he says, uh, For he said to him, Come out of this man, unclean spirit. And then he asked him, What's your name? And he answered, saying, My name is Legion, for we are many. Also, he begged him earnestly that he would not send him out of the country. You know, I think this is a reassurance, too, that the devil has no power of our lives. But it's only when we allow, um, or it's only when we listen to his lies. You know, isn't that the problem? Sometimes we listen to his lies. And we think, oh, if you just do this, it's your, you know, or that. And, and we listen to him. Verse 11 says, Now a large herd of swine was feeding there near the mountains. So all the demons begged him, saying, Send us to the swine that we may enter them. And at once Jesus gave them permission. Then the unclean spirits went out, entered the swine, and there were about 2,000. And, and the herd ran violently down the steep place into the sea and drowned in the sea. You know, these demons say, you know, if we can't be in this person... Let us go into the pigs. <laughs> Makes no difference to them. People are pigs, you know. Now, back to Deuteronomy real quick. Again, the Lord says clearly not to cut yourselves. You know, not to destroy, not to harm yourselves. And I think, you know, well, then just to transition a little, we get this list. Look at verse 3. It says, you shall not eat detestable things. Verse 3. I'm actually going to skip around because it just basically tells us all the animals they should or shouldn't eat. But look at verse uh, 10. It says, uh, and whatever does not have fins, scales, you shall not eat. This is unclean for you. And then verse uh, 21 you should not, not eat anything that dies itself. You may give it to the alien who is within your gates that he may eat it, or you may sell it to a foreigner, for you are a holy people to the Lord your God. You shall not boil a young goat in its mother's milk. And so we're given these, these clean and unclean meats. 
Um, now, it's interesting because if you were to eat something like that, there's, there's, you know, and there's other things that the Jews, if they did, if they came across a dead body, if they, if they did, ate something, it would make them unclean. And, you know, unclean wasn't quite like sinning, but it was very close because there was consequences for being unclean. Uh, you know, the, the, it, it, it involved they couldn't participate in worship. It involved they wouldn't participate in fellowship with God. There were certain things they couldn't, they couldn't be part of it, right? Remember the, you know, the lepers, they would have to yell through the streets, unclean, unclean, you know, stay away from me. They couldn't, they couldn't be part of things. And, and again, there's these special dietary restrictions that no longer apply to us. Thank you, Lord. Praise God. We can have bacon, <laughs> right? <clears throat> but, you know, because Jesus himself, he declared all these foods are clean. They're clean. And, he, you know, Jesus, he actually went a little farther. He said, you know what, these things, you know, what defiles a person is not the food that, goes in, that they ingest in their body, but what's in the heart. That's what defiles us. So that's what we have to be careful now is what comes into our heart. In that last verse, that last part there, it says, you shall not boil a young goats in its mother's milk. Now, in Israel, they take that literally today. So when you are in Israel, you will never find meat and cheese in the same place. Yeah. So in the morning, you eat the cheese or the, the dairy, right? In the evening, you eat the meat, right? And so, um, but if you go into a pizza place, no meat on the pizza. <laughs> because of this verse right here, they, even, even the secular Jews, they, they still adhere to that. Now, Lisa and I went to McDonald's, and the guy's like, you guys are American? We're like, yeah. He's like, you want cheese in your hamburger? We're like, yeah. And he did it. So, anyways. (laughs) (laughs) Israeli McDonald's. Thank you. (laughs) Um, You know, as I was thinking about this, you know, I guess all this to say, I'm concerned that, you know, like in Israel today, they, they still follow these things, but they don't necessarily know why. And they're not doing it for the Lord. And, and I was thinking about, I'm concerned that as Christians, that as, as the church, that we lose our, our clarity, you know, as Christians living in this world because it's so secular, it's so pagan here in America. And we have to be so careful that, that we stand out. I just, again, if you go to verse 1, you're children of the Lord, your God. You shall not cut yourself. Uh, in verse 2, you're a holy people, chosen, special. I mean, that's us today. I couldn't help but think of that, you know, we have to be careful that we don't become more and more like the church of Laodicea. You know, because in Revelation 3.15, it says, I know your works, but then he says, you're neither, hot nor, you're neither cold nor hot, but I wish you were cold or hot. But because you're lukewarm and neither cold or hot, I'll vomit you out of my mouth. Because you say, I'm rich, I've become wealthy, I've needed nothing. And you do not, he says, you do not know. He says, you do not know that you're wretched and miserable and poor and blind and naked. And we have to be careful that as a church, I mean, it's a warning to us <laughs> that we don't fall into that trap of being neither hot or lukewarm. And as we studied on Sunday in, in Hebrews 12, you know, it's again, um, verse 1, therefore we also, since we're surrounded by such a great cloud of witness, let us lay aside every weight and the sin that so easily ensnares us and let us run with endurance the race that's set before us. You know, again, as I mentioned, you know, we might no, you know, we know sins to lay aside. We understand that. We understand when something's sin, but, but, but what about the weights in our life? So it doesn't necessarily, doesn't necessarily have to be sin, but it's things that's weighing us down. It's things that take us away from the Lord. You know, things that, that slow us down, that, that, that keep us from, from, you know, following the Lord wholeheartedly. And this last section in, Deuteronomy 14 is on tithing. Let me read verse 22. 
It says, uh, you shall truly tithe all the increase of your grain that the field produces year by year. And he goes on and, and says, you shall eat before the Lord your God in the place where he chooses to make his name abide, the tithe of your grain, your new wine and your oil, the firstborn of your herds, your flocks, that you may learn to fear the Lord your God always. And it goes on and talks about that. You know, I, I always, I think it's important. Why does God want people to give? I think it's, I think honestly it's because he knows it's good for us. He just knows it's good for us. You know, because, you know, I think giving for us, tithing, I mean, we can, we can say, you know, tithing or giving, but it's, it, it just simply teaches us to trust God. <laughs> When we give him the first, when we, we give him this, the, you know, we, we're saying, I depend upon you, God. And I think it gives us a chance to see God work, his, you know, in our lives as we're obedient to him. It, it's an important lesson, I think, to, to do. You know, one translation says here, it says, um, the purpose of tithing is to teach you always to put God first in your lives. I like that. That's what it is. It's, it's giving is putting God first. Lord, I'm going to give you this, right? Now, I also want to be clear when I say this because I don't like people to misunderstand me because I don't think we give to God to be blessed, right? Because that would be like the, the faith, <laughs> the word of faith teachers, right? We, we don't give him to get in something in return because we've already been blessed, <laughs> Right? We just give because he's blessed us. He's given us his life, you know. So anyways, I'm going to stop there. I'll let you read through the chapter if you want to, all the little details. But Lord, we just, oh, Lord, we thank you for tonight. We thank you that we can study this chapter, Lord, and even as Christians in the year 2022, Lord, and we can, we can gain from this, Lord. And I, I, I think of that Mark chapter, Lord, uh, and just, I, I just I can't help but think of our society in which we live and just how there's so much destruction and, and, and Satan, it just seems like he's, he's gained so much control over people's lives. And Lord, we just, even right now, we pray, Lord, for those maybe, maybe we know people who, who Satan has just completely robbed them, destroyed them, has, has, has they've believed the lies Lord, he's the, he's the, um, he's the liar. <laughs> and I just would pray, Father, that you would come. And I, I just think of the homeless people, Lord, that have bought into the lie and of Satan's destruction. Um, the, the, those that are on drugs, those are family members and their friends, Lord, that have just completely gone overboard lord we pray for them lord we pray for them to return to you lord for you to touch their hearts lord for you to draw them to you lord we pray that lord that you would bring any prodigals back home lord that you would that you would touch their hearts even right now lord as we pray for them the, our, our 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 kids lord we pray that 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 you would just do a mighty work in their lives, that your Holy Spirit would come touch them, that they would just have a desire and a hunger to come back to you, to come back to your word. And, and Lord, maybe, the, maybe there would be a Christian in, in their life that they would reach out to, Lord, or maybe they would just pick up a Bible. And, and Lord, the Bible would just, it would just come alive. It would just, it would just touch their hearts. Or maybe, Lord, as you do in foreign countries often, Lord, you, you show yourself in a dream, Lord, and you, and you reveal yourself to them. Maybe, maybe we, just, what, we, we pray you would do whatever it takes to bring people back to you, Lord. And we just pray against the, the enemy, Lord. The enemy is, 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 um, is working overtime in this country. Lord, he's working overtime and, and destroying so many lives. And we pray against that, Lord. We pray that you, which have so much more power than him, Lord, would, would work, a mighty work. And I just pray for, for us too, Lord, as, as believers, that, that we wouldn't get caught up in, in these things, Lord, that we wouldn't let the weights, that we wouldn't allow 
the enemy to rip us off, that we too would just, we, we would be on fire for you, Lord. We'd, we would not be lukewarm Christians, Lord, but we would just, we would love you and, and we would press on, Lord. So we just give this all to you in Jesus' name. Amen. We need you. Oh, we need you. Every hour we need you. Our one defense, our righteousness. Oh, God, how we need you. We need you. Oh, we need you. Every hour we need you. Our one defense, our righteousness. Oh, God, how we need you. came for criminals and every Pharisee. You came for hypocrites, even one like me. You carried sin and shame, the guilt of every man. The weight of all I've done Nailed into your hand Oh, your love Bled for me Oh, your blood In crimson streams Oh, your death is hell's defeat the cross meant to kill is my victory I've seen and tasted it, it's running through my veins, I can't escape its grip, in you my soul is safe, you cover everything, yes you do Lord, oh your love bled for me, oh your blood in crimson streams oh your death it's hell's defeat the cross meant to kill is my victory us alive again, makes us alive again. Behold the Lamb of God who takes away our sin, takes away our sin. The Holy Lamb of God makes us alive again, makes us alive again. Oh, your blood bled for me. Oh, your blood 
in crimson streams but oh your death it tells defeat the cross meant to kill is my victory a cross meant to kill is my victory My hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest frame, but wholly trust Jesus' name. My hope is built, my hope is built on nothing less than Jesus' blood and righteousness. I dare not trust the sweetest thing, but wholly trust in Jesus' name. Christ alone, cornerstone, weak made strong in the Savior's love. Through the storm, He is Lord, Lord of all. When darkness seems to hide his face, I rest on his unchanging grace. In every high and stormy gale, my anchor holds within the veil. My anchor holds within the way Christ alone cornerstone weak made strong in the Savior's love through the storm He is Lord Lord When he shall come with trumpet sound, who oh, may I then in him be found? Dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless stand before the throne. When he shall come with trumpet sound, may I then in him be found, dressed in his righteousness alone, faultless to stand before the throne. Faultless to stand before the throne. When I survey.
on which the prince of glory died my riches came I count but love and broken on all my pride forbid it Lord that I should go save in the death oh Christ my God all the vain things I charm me most sacrifice him to his blood see from his head his hands his feet sorrow and love Oh, mingle down Did it such love And sorrow me Oh, thorns compose So rich a crown the whole realm of nature mine that were far too small love so amazing so divine demands my soul my life my all Love so amazing, so divine, demands my soul, demands my soul, demands my soul. My life, my To the cross I look, and to the cross I cling, of its suffering I do dream, 
of its work I do sing for on it my Savior both bruised and crushed to show that God is love and that God is just At the cross you beckon me, you draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for words, so lost in love I'm sweetly broken, holy surrender. Give the undeserved life I've been given through Christ crucified. You call me out of death, you call me into life. I was under your wrath and Through the cross I'm reconciled Let's stand together At the cross you beckon me You draw me gently to my knees And I am lost for words So lost for love I'm Sweetly broken, wholly surrendered At the cross you, you beckon me You draw me gently to my knees And I am lost for words, so lost for love I'm sweetly broken, wholly surrendered all of the cross I must confess How wondrous your redeeming love And how great is your faithfulness At the cross you beckon me you Draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for words so lost in love I'm sweetly broken wholly surrendered at the cross you you beckon me you draw me gently to my knees and I am lost for words so lost in love I'm Sweetly broken, holy surrender. surrender, Lord. May that be our heart, Lord. We would allow you, Lord, you, we would allow you to break us. That, that we would surrender our wills, Lord. Lord, that we would yield to you, Lord. It's just sweetly broken, not broken by a, a God that is uh, lords it over us. That's, that's not your character, Lord. You are, you are love and you love us so much. You love us too much to leave us where we are. And so, Lord, may we be sweetly broken beneath your will and your, uh, your leading us and your, uh, you, you taking us, Lord, where you want us to go. I pray that that would be 
our hearts cry, Lord, we'd be yielding to you every day, Lord. Thank you for tonight. Thank you for your word. Thank you that we can sing, we can worship, and we can fellowship. Thank you, Lord, for the, the unity of your spirit. Amen. Amen. God bless you guys. Have a good week. See you Sunday.